But before we dive right in, can I just say, what a privilege to have such a wonderful panel that reflects the, both the wisdom of experience and the passion of youth. And speaking of youth, Mr. President, if I may start with you, when you were younger, not many years ago, what was the biggest challenge you saw on the continent and how far do you think we've come in addressing it? Let me start by saying uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, and uh, express how happy I am to be here, uh, having a discussion with you, but uh, wanted to welcome my brother, a friend, uh, Prime Minister of Lesotho, to uh, Matekane to be here with us. Uh, he took uh, uh, all the trouble and canceled uh, other programs. So he was here because of the importance of this meeting. So thank you very much, Prime Minister. Now back to the question. First, when I was very young, that was a long, long time ago. <laughs> uh, so many decades. I don't think I had, uh, at the beginning, the eyes to see what the problem was. I was seeing the problem, but I didn't understand it. I, I, I saw problems, I experienced problems, but um, it took some time before um, I realized that uh, these are things that uh, shouldn't be happening uh, to people, including myself. Um, and as I was growing up, I also discovered that maybe something can be done about it and uh, that it is not uh, other people to do it uh, other than ourselves. Um, a bit of history, when I was very young, um, started when I was about four. You can imagine at four I wasn't thinking very much about anything. I was just seeing things happen. But uh, um, that's when my family went into exile, uh, left this country. The, the family was fine by the standard of that time. They really didn't uh, have any problems. Um, so, but we became refugees in the neighboring country. From that time, I was four. Uh, so I grew up as a refugee. Like many, many Rwandans, I, I'm sure some of them are here, but more their parents than themselves, because most of the people here are very young. Probably they were born when we came back here. Or, or oh, in those early years, just before we, we came back to the country. Um, so, but I'm trying to condense, you know, what you have to say in a short time. As we grow up, therefore, as refugees and the suffering that comes with it and so on and so forth. But I think also the lessons that come with it. We grew up uh, experiencing things that taught us many lessons, other than going to school and here and there. We learned other things that you don't learn in school, but you learn in life, just in life. Uh, so what, to the particular question, 
the problem I saw was I was even asking myself. I asked my father when I was 12. Uh, whom I lost when I was 15. But at 12, I asked my father, I said, what did we do? Why are we here? Why are we in a refugee camp, feeding by way of getting ration uh, every week? He went into a long story which explained the problem, but I, I won't repeat that, but I think it was clear that it was politics, it was uh, the leaders, it was, uh, in our case, it was uh, a convergence of colonial times and uh, the times of independence. And, you know, everything was just what it should not have been. So those are lessons we learned. So something was wrong. But it, it is disheartening to, to, when you see that what I'm talking about then, so many years ago, in the 60s, some of them are happening even now. You still have people Especially young people suffer the most, I imagine, and their mothers, and uh, you still have people suffering, and suffering because of politics, because of uh, all kinds of uh, bad governance. Uh, and um, yeah, today, why should, I, as I experienced it when I was four years, why should it be happening now? anywhere, it doesn't have to be in, in this country, why should it happen anywhere, say on our continent? That uh, we still have refugees, we still have uh, uh, tribal conflicts, we still have all kinds of uh, things, people fighting each other than building themselves and building their countries. Uh, so it is it, for me. It, it's a, a lesson learned, a lesson that also shaped some of us um, until this day. And um, for the young people here in the room, you don't have to go through that in order to be shaped the right way as. Uh, Many, of, many young people at that time came out to be. To be. Uh, so you can learn even lessons of others, things that happened in time, in history, to other people. And also uh, put yourself in that position where you may think, oh, well, it's supposed to happen to me, or it can even happen to me. What uh, should I do? to prevent that, or what would I do if I face that, uh, to actually come through it alive and, and manage it well, but that is not just you, it becomes a, a bigger community, a bigger society that uh, we are talking about. So probably I gave you more than you asked for, but uh, Thank you, Mr. stop President. here for now. Thank you for that reflection. It is indeed disheartening. Thank you. It is indeed disheartening to hear that political instability is still ravaging some of our African countries. And I hope that to the youth listening, you can reflect on some of these uh, lessons. Right Honorable Prime Minister, good morning and welcome again. If we were to pivot a little bit and look at Africa with its rich cultural heritage, in your view, how can we generate economic value and opportunities through the empowerment of our artisans, entrepreneurs, and our young people? First of all, let me pay respect to His Excellency and to our distinguished guest, 
and esteemed colleagues. I'm one of those people that come a long way in business. I know that I might not be direct to your question, but just want to phrase it somehow with the experience that I have had uh, on my journey to where I am today. Where are we coming from in Lesotho? I come from Lesotho. Normally in Lesotho, when you start your youth, starting from the age of maybe five, you start being a head boy, looking after your parents' animal. That's that life I have lived. You will find that uh, it's quite difficult because even if we are head boys, we start going to school. You won't be able to be going to school every day because you have to exchange. Uh, if I go on, on a Monday, my brother will go on a Tuesday, on and on like that. So you'll find that in a week, someone goes to school twice, the other one three times, next week it will be the other way around. But where I want to go is these things of our youth getting into business and also having some uh, jobs opportunities is a very good thing. And we really encourage it. Some of those of them they are very innovative. We are seeing very good things that is coming out of them. What they are doing, which was never the case in our times. And we are saying, let's support them. In my case, I started business in a very young age. I think when I started business, I was around 20. You'll find that uh, in those days, it's way dif different from now, where children have got advantages of going to school, learning, studying, and all the things that are associated with the, the future today. I started business at a very early age of about 20 where I started with uh, a brick making concrete. Uh, what they call it, in my language I would be saying sitini, which is a concrete brick. I was manufacturing those and I was selling them to the locals for them to build up their houses. That went on and then uh, I was involved in many other things, like the selling of animals. You know, we would go to South Africa, which is our neighbor, buy the donkeys, take them to the mountains. Remember, these are done by food. You take too many days on the road, driving this to the highlands, so that you can be able to trade them and get cattle or sheep and bring them to the city, which is Maseru, where now you sell them to the uh, butcheries or to the abattoir. So those are the lives that uh, one has lived. But as time goes on, I just want to say to our youth, patience pays. 
be a patient patient. Up until as time goes up, goes up I touched in many different uh, businesses uh, up until before I joined politics. I was one of the top business people in Lesotho. The, our young generation will know that um, unlike us in the past, you'll find that uh, your father owns Bedford truck. They will own something that of those days which stood baker vehicles, which our youth does not even know about today. The life that they are living today needs them to work very hard and be able to achieve greater things. The cars of today have got first names and same names and that is their cars. You will be talking about Aston Martins, Rolls Royce, Porsche Cayenne. This is where you are, our youth. Be patient, take your time, make money. One day you will be able to achieve all this. Thank you so much, right, Honorable. I think there are many lessons here for the youth, and one of them is uh, youth, let's be patient. It takes time to get a Porsche, right? Um, another lesson, right, Honorable, is I think it's a testament to your story where you are that African ingenuity is at an all-time high, and we should be able to monetize and embrace our creativity. Now turning to our youth voice on the panel, Mombi. You see firsthand the challenges young Africans face in finding and developing their skills. With your work in skilling young people, how do you project the future of work in Africa? Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Mumbi Ndongo. I'm from uh, Kenya. Kenyans, hello. <laughs> and I'm really honored to be here in this esteemed panel. So just to give a brief background of who I am before I answer the question. Um, so my name is Mumbi. I am a chief change maker at what uh, we call Powerland Project, which is a pan-African impact organization working to build capacity in technology. And we do this by innovating around education and providing scholarships to train software developers across the continent and get them opportunities for work. So uh, regarding the question about the future of work, um, just to give context, we were launched in about three years ago. And so far, we've been able to train about 15,000 young people across the continent of Africa. And 15,000 may seem like a huge number, but if you see the actual need for uh, the demand, the actual gap, we're not even scratching the surfaces yet. But the beauty of this is that we've been able to find ways uh, to collaborate with different institutions um, to find solutions for these young people in regards to how we perceive the future of work is going to be. And I think while answering this question, there's a lot of uh, conversation about how the future of work looks like, especially for Africa. But for mine, I think I just want to put it in context for the young people here, because I understand first and foremost, we are an extremely practical generation. So we want to see what you're saying in action. So at Powerland, our first cohort, we were able to train about 1,000 young people. Um, out of this 1,000, there's a young man known as uh, Ben. So Ben is about 21. His parents were not able to afford for him to continue with law school. So he had to drop out, especially post the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, and with what we were able to do, we were able to give him an opportunity through Powerland Project to build his skills in technology. And as we speak right now, Ben was able to create uh, one of the uh, a solution, a fintech solution that's currently working across the continent of Africa. But his journey didn't just begin from there. So when he was done with the program, he was able to join Powerland Project as an intern. 
but he could tell his desire for where he wanted to go was a much bigger than what uh, Powerland was providing at that time. So he got an opportunity to do some remote work, gig work with a company in the United States using the skills he was able to get through Powerland Project. Um, at this point, he was head of engineers. He was managing a lot of engineer, young engineers uh, within the context of the startup. He was earning roughly about $4,000 a month, which ideally in this context is pretty much good money for a young person who's about 22. Within five months, he realized there was a problem, and the problem was heavily around how he would receive his money. So he had a huge challenge with accessing money that he had already worked for. So he decided to create a solution for that by building Africa's first neobank for gig workers that is known as PAID. As we speak at this moment, uh, Ben and his team has been able to create jobs for over eight other young people across Africa. They've been able to transact roughly about 300,000 US dollars in a year's time through their platform because they understand the future of work is heavily going to be driven by gig work and freelancing work. So if we don't have a solution on how our young people can be paid, then how do we expect the economy to grow? And this just goes back to answer your question regarding the future of work. The future of work is not linear, it's dynamic. It requires a lot of agility, especially around education. How are we training our young people? Why are we taking so long to revise curriculums in universities and schools? Because now it means that a lot of young people are missing out and there's a huge gap, market to, uh, skills to market gap. Secondly, there's a lot of uh, conversation around technology. So the future of work is heavily going to be reliant on technology. How are we leveraging this opportunity as Africa at this moment to make sure that our young people have skills to adapt to technology and use it as a conduit to empower the other different sectors that they may require? So um, just to summarize that, I think the future of work is extremely diverse, and I think that's the first point, because if we look at just one person like Ben who's been able to impact with our little work, and then the 60% of the population of Africa who's young people, then we need to think around the solutions that we're creating for that. Thank you. Absolutely. That's a powerful story you've told. And thank you. It's inspiring to hear the work that you're doing um, to open the doors for young people. Speaking of youth and the future, Mr. President, if I may come back to you. As we look to the future, Africa holds incredible potential with its young workforce. And it, it's often said that one in four young people globally will be African. In your view, what should Africa prioritize over the next decade to position itself as a leading source of global talent? Yeah, um, from what you just stated, uh, what is obvious is that we have the numbers. Indeed. Now, next is to work out the quality of those numbers. It's not just going to be numbers, it's also whether. So we have to invest in, uh, uh, in our uh, different systems that uh, the young people grow through. Uh, whether it is education, it is, uh, uh, but it's something we always forget at times. Uh, you provide education, you mind their health, you uh, call upon them to participate and even in their own growth as well as their country's growth. But there has to be that environment that actually allows everything to happen. I'll come back to the politics of everything. The politics that uh, allows stability to prevail, and therefore within that, all kinds of things to be done that we are talking about. We have to build the infrastructure therefore on top of that that serves uh, these young people. Uh, and then their task, which they always uh, are going to be good at, uh, will be 
entrepreneurship, as you have been told, it will be about innovation, it will be about uh, doing whatever business that uh, earns them a good living that everyone aspires uh, toward. So um, Africa has everything to be where we want to be, to be who we want to be. So we can only blame ourselves for not achieving that. And therefore, to avoid the blame of blaming ourselves, that's why I started with saying the politics has got to be right and it has to provide the stability that therefore uh, creates that environment uh, where people can do what they are best at. Uh, we have seen it's no longer just the potential. People have been talking about the potential of our continent. No, we've just seen uh, how that potential to an extent has materialized to actually prove that everything is possible. So why not do more of what we've been doing to prove the case and, and make sure that more and more people benefit from being the best they can be and, from, and also benefit from uh, doing the very things that uh, we always talk about. Uh, and, and, and here I have to say we, we should also get tired of just saying the right things for so long. We want to see the right things happen and uh, resulting from... Uh, uh, you know, I'm thankful that uh, in the program uh, we saw today, I, I was really happy when they didn't call me up to give a speech. Uh, I, I, I was... Uh, not, not that I'm, uh, I'm saying others shouldn't give speeches, <laughs> but I'm saying at, at a personal level, I have been on this stage saying so many things and uh, even repeating myself. And then I see uh, my brothers and sisters, colleagues doing the same uh, over and over and over and over, it's five years, it's 10 years, it's 20. But then we need to ask, even before anybody asks us, we need to ask ourselves, but what is, uh, what to show for what we've been saying? Uh, we really need to get tired of this. I think, uh, I can't uh, emphasize it enough, but uh, I think. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes. Um, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. It's clear that quality is crucial, and I hope that for the sake of our continent, quantity and quality will go hand in hand, and that there will be no repetition mm -hmm. after this Youth Connect Summit. Prime Minister, building on what Mr. President was sharing, when we think about the future, now it's synonymous with technologies. How can African leaders leverage the rise of AI technologies and digital solutions to deliver inclusive and relevant skilling and employment opportunities for the young people? Thank you very much, moderator. Um, I think our young people have got a lot of lot on their plate. Africa has got a lot of minerals and other things that they can bank on. Before they even go outside to the far world, we need to work within ourselves and trade between ourselves as Africans, as our youth. I 
our biggest trade problems that we had in the past was access to finance being one of them that hampered growth mm. but lately you find that there are a lot of institutions where you can be able to approach them and they can be able to assist that is how you grow your business and that is how you grow yourself so by making sure that you have the bank loans and other things but what is very 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 important is whoever helped you with his finances or their finances make sure you pay back <laughs> don't just take and walk away because the problem with that is it is true that you'll take and go away but life does not end there tomorrow you're going to need the same people that try to help you businesses requires the presence of the people that have started them your presence there to make sure that you turn your own dream true is required in business in the old days it was very difficult because you wouldn't go to the bank to ask for money but these days it's very easy and everything now has become even more easier because most of the things are digitalized now so many of the things can be done and done correctly because of what we can access these days i thank you thank you right honorable thank you for highlighting the importance of access to finance and finally to our young leader on the panel as we close what would you say to the african youth present today who may feel discouraged or unsure about the future in such a rapidly changing world um thank you so much so i think uh perhaps maybe to put this in context i'll just briefly share about my story as well um so about three years ago before starting powerland project i worked in a development finance institution for a period of over six to seven years and to be honest i was in a good place i didn't need to leave and go into entrepreneurship to start you know, providing solutions for other young people. But when the COVID pandemic hit, I saw a lot of my friends who are entrepreneurs really suffer. And they were suffering because they were not able to adapt quickly enough to create, uh, to make sure that their businesses are digitized fast enough so they can continue operating during the pandemic. And most of them, even when they wanted to do that, they could not afford uh, such things as quality talent just to build you a website or to create an app where people can access your products. And so just sitting down and creating this program that we were able to create and having the impact that is had currently right now, I think it was a good sense of validation. It goes to also answer a lot of, uh, just to reiterate a lot of what has been said here today. One is heavily around patience. I know where the world is right now, it seems like a lot is not in order. A lot is not working out in order within your own context of your country, within the context of the world. But I think we have quite an advantage because we have been brought up in this generation where we have access to information. Um, if we look at what we can do with that information, how we can empower ourselves with that information to create change within our communities, I think it would take us to the next level. It would take Africa to where we believe that we can rely on ourselves heavily. The second thing is around accountability. Um, and I know for a lot of us, especially here, the fact that you're in this room already means you have some sort of agency for you to get access to a space like this. 
But in the long time, if you've doing, been doing this work for a long time, you get frustrated with small things like accountability because we sit here, we have big conversations. We, I was at the Summit of the Future. We were creating amazing parks here that we really employ. The young people are the ones who are going to empower these uh, particular things to move from paper to action. But when you go back home and there's this element and sense of lack of accountability, you sort of feel some sense of frustration um, and you feel like you're hopeless, but I'm just here to urge you that sometimes it's up to us to take the opportunity. It's up to us to take control of this, um, of this opportunity to make sure that we are the change that we want to see. And lastly, it's heavily ad around being a risk taker. There's a Latin saying that says, fortune favors the bold. And I heavily, heavily believe that once we rely on taking certain risks, I believe that the outcome of this, there's beauty that lies on the other side of fear. So if you take nothing else home today, I know you're sitting somewhere thinking about a certain idea or already doing a certain idea and feeling that you're not getting the support that you need for it. The fact that you took that risk, if I didn't, I didn't take this risk, risk three years ago, the 20,000 people we've been able to impact would not have th that opportunity. My goal is to train at least a million developers by 2030. It seems like a, such a big number, but if you see the gap that is, exists, I'm not even scratching the surface. So just by taking that risk, wherever you are, in your different spaces, within government, within private sector, you are creating possibility and hope for a future for someone else. You may not feel it directly, but I promise you that the outcome of this is what we are talking about here, having an Africa that's sustainable, having an Africa that heavily relies on itself. Thank you. Wow. What an encouraging message. I think staying resilient and patient is something we can all strive for. Please join me in thanking our panelists as we come to the end of our dialogue. A big round of applause. Now, I would like to usher us in the, into the Q&A session. We will get to hear from you, your questions, your reflections. I will start to my right, and we will sweep the room all the way to the left. But please, when you get the mic, present yourself, and you have about 20 seconds to give us your question. We will start to my right. If we could get, please get the mics on the floor. Do we have any hands up? Excellence, Monsieur le Président, Honorable Prime Minister, distinguished guests, all protocol observed, please reserve my warm greetings on Jaram. Munara Mutse, bonjour. I am Amadou Tal from the Republic of Guinea, the paradise. I lead Nimba SMS, an emerging telecommunication startup. Excellencies, as International Telecommunication Union Africa Youth Envoy, I strongly believe that access to relevant information and data in this digital era is essential for empowering my generation, the young people to make informed decisions contribute meaningfully to society and take Africa forward. My question is, how can government build an ecosystem that provides accessible data, relevant and digital information while empowering youth to develop essential digital information literacy skills? Thank you. Thank you. We will take about three questions in a row, and we will let our panelists give our panelists time to answer. Please keep it to 20 seconds. Second question, we will go in the back. Please tell us your names and straight into your question. Your Excellencies, bonjour, good morning, wara motse. My name is Wedrago Mohamed Basiru. I'm from Burkina Faso, the country of the honest men. <laughs> On behalf of the people of Burkina Faso, 
uh, would like to address uh, an issue about the entrepreneurship. Every time we have been afraid of being scammed by, Af our, uh, by our African peers, uh, we all know here that it's very difficult to pursue an individual in another country uh, different than ours in, the ca in case of uh, disagreement. So my question is, as decision maker, what policies can be uh, implemented through the ZLICAF in order to protect, facilitate, and secure the collaboration among the young entrepreneurs in African countries? Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Ibarka. Basiru, the question wasn't clear, but let me see if I can try and summarize, and maybe you can tell us if that was it. From my understanding, you're asking about dispute resolution and how policies, and what policymakers can do to yeah, secure. In fact, I was saying that it's very difficult nowadays, if, for example, I'm in Burkina Faso, and I want to collaborate with uh, um, another young man in another country, it's very difficult. Yeah, in case of disagreement, it's difficult for me to pursue that individual. So uh, what can be done to, like, uh, to protect me and him in case of disagreement? So dispute resolution. Uh, yes, maybe. Or is it legal disagreement? Sorry? Do you mean by le in case of legal disagreement? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Is it clearer? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, third question right here in the middle and we will take some answers. All protocols be highly observed. Good morning. My name is Hope Ezra Mkwinda from Zambia and I'm an African Union, European Union Youth Advisory Board member. My question is addressed to the excellencies. So we as young people, we believe that blending experiences uh, of older generations with the innovation and energy of the youth, we can unlock great potentials of the youth. So my question is, how can we bridge the gap through intergenerational mentorship to carry on the values and principles of the older generation? Thank you. Thank you. I think we will take the three questions and give the time to our panelists to answer. We will start from uh, Youth Envoy from Paradise. Your Excellency, would you like to take uh, the Let question? me attempt to answer the question, but, but the way I understood it, uh, I, I think the, the, it's not a, an issue of uh, what can be done to have access to this information and uh, to as many people as uh, it is actually being done already in a number of places. Uh, but how can we scale that up and uh, make sure that uh, it's almost a given that people looking for information they have a way to access it and uh, later on use it as they wish. Like uh, in this case, uh, say in the case of Rwanda, we have uh, created uh, different portals. Uh, there are different uh, systems uh, through which people can access whatever information to serve the public or the private entities. If you look at uh, uh, Irembo, it just does that. Uh, it does provide uh, information. Maybe one can complain it isn't uh, as efficient yet as it should be, but largely, uh, people can access uh, whatever information from whichever sector uh, very easily. Uh, so that can be. So there, there are 
different things that have already been done. So it's not really a, a, a question of what. Uh, it's now whether uh, actually that is happening or it is uh, providing the services that uh, uh, people need. So, so I, I think, and, and that's another area where the private people, the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the, uh, also can play a role in the kinds of uh, investments of their knowledge or other resources to make it happen and serve the public as it should. Thank you, Mr. President. For the question by Basira from Burkina Faso, the one around dispute resolution and um, what policies can be put in place to secure collaboration, could I please give it to you, right honorable? I think what we need to do uh, as countries is to come up with uh, agreements and probably make it easier for our youth to create opportunities between themselves, to trade between themselves, and create policies to, uh, to make it easy for them to trade between themselves. And so that if there's a dispute or, or misunderstanding between themselves or between uh, their countries as well, it will be much easier to resolve such dispute. But in short, we need to make Africa one. That's what we need to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Right Honorable. And for the question from Zambia around bridging the gap between the generations, since we have the youth on the panel, I'd love to hand this uh, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. So I think uh, my first answer would be um, on mentorship. Um, from my own experience, I am a huge proponent of uh, mentorship. I'm a result of uh, mentorship. So I believe the best way we can bridge that gap is by actively being intentional around how we design mentorship programs for young people, uh, for them to give them, and creating spaces such as this where we can have conversations with, uh, between generations to see how we can learn from each other and foster growth together. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for two more questions? All right. Two more questions. Your name, your country, and straight to the point. Thank you. We've done the side, so let's go all the way to the left. Any microphones on the floor? Monsieur, Monsieur le Président, uh, cher décideurs africains, je vous dis salam et Muraho. Je suis uh, good afternoon. Ornella My name is Ornella Je viens de Madagascar. I'm from Madagascar. Et je suis, je suis entrepreneur I'm dans l'événementiel et la restauration. Uh, in the events and, uh, la jeunesse africaine, uh, in the event bien sector. que nous représentons la majeure partie youth, de la even population, nous n'avons pas de pouvoir économique. Nous n'avons pas de pouvoir économique. Nous n'avons pas de pouvoir power. On the one side, there is a mismatch between the training and the job market needs. So there is a mismatch, and this is even uh, uh, made worse uh, by technology development, because uh, uh, those who want to have a decent job, they don't have access to it. On the other side, for us as entrepreneurs, we are also faced on uh, illegal competition uh, from those who are the owners of means, the owners of uh, infrastructures that also limit us in uh, our quest for the African market. Market. We agree that uh, Africa cannot develop without its young population. Now, my question is this. What is your strategy as decision makers? What is your strategy to ensure this matching between training, between the education and the job market, but also to promote uh, entrepreneurship for African youth? Thank you very much. Yes. Merci Ornella. Je vais essayer de, de traduire très vite. 
Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I understood from your question is there, ha there happens to be a mismatch between skills that we acquire from the schools and what the job market requires. And your question is, what strategies can we put in place to bridge that gap? Correct, I've got a thumbs up. Um, your Excellency, yeah. I think you can take the question. Well, first of all, let's really acquire the skills as we know them. And then uh, the problem of uh, reconciling uh, that with the, what has to be done is much easier. I think the, the, the most important thing is to have the skills. Let's have the skills, but also in the process of having those skills, maybe people need to look at uh, the different uh, educational programs and, and those of training to see whether they are actually indeed answering uh, the very questions we have uh, to apply them to. So th that is, I think, a much easier problem than not having the skills, providing the skills. Right. So I think I would rather uh, concentrate on providing the skills as I think about the applications mm -hmm. of those skills to what it needs to be done, uh, but shouldn't be an impediment uh, for the supply of the skills that are necessary broadly, and then also we can address this problem in a parallel, in my view. It doesn't have to be a big problem. We shouldn't even be thinking about it so much as a problem, but rather as a, an opportunity also that provides a, some work to do in reconciling what it needs to be reconciled. Thank you, Mr. President. One last question from the left. If we could get the mic to one more person. Again, a kind reminder, please state your name, country you're from, and straight into the question. His Excellency, uh, Mr. President Paul Kagame, and the, and the rest of the visitors, I have a question. Um, with increasing focus on skills like creativity, problem solving, and adaptability, how can Africa's education system integrate these skills into the traditional curricula? Because most of our problem is our curriculum is too traditional and when we get out, we are not able to integrate into the society and the skills to acquire. We, we find that we have to also learn other skills outside our education system. So um, what is the government doing to better prepare the youth and to also integrate uh, these skills into the traditional curricula. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, the, it, it's a question that keeps repeating itself. Um, we've gotten an answer from His Excellency. Perhaps then we take one more that is different from the previous question. <laughs> so I have a request from uh, the Right Honorable. We will take one question from someone from Lesotho. Yes. Are you from Lesotho? No, je suis du Burkina okay. Faso. Yeah. Vous êtes du Burkina Faso. Alors, oh, je, vais, je vais demander qu'on prenne une question from someone from Lesotho for now, please, on this side, and we might come back to you, Burkina Faso. Just... OK, merci. What is Yeah, the one raising here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Microphone. Yeah, they, they might ask something that is different. From <laughs> <laughs> uh, protocol observed. My name is Letlata Ramabele from Lesotho. In countries such as Lesotho, you'll find that there are institutions such as USAID where entrepreneurs apply for matching grant. And you'll find that entrepreneurs sometimes will be required to bring a certain amount to access such funds. Like, there's a, a company that I know which won about uh, five million from the USAID, but they could not be able to raise the amount that was needed from them. 
So I wish to know if there is a way that the government or their strategic allies can ensure that the entrepreneurs, if they have managed to access those funds from USAID, they can get the money that is required from them. Like, you'll find that they will say the grant will expire if you are not able to deliver within this milestone that we have set. Thank you. Right, Honorable Bro? Would you like to take the question? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not that one, not the one from Lesotho. Mm. <laughs> not the one from Lesotho. All right, I'll throw this to Mumbi. Mumbi, Try that. you are, uh, <laughs> so, save the day. Okay, um, I think I heavily uh, relate to what he mentioned because uh, being in this space and working with different partners, uh, every partner comes in with their own recommendations and conditions of how you get to access their resources. Right. Um, and I think one of the core conversations we were having when we were here previously, I think around August, was around how uh, we can work with different partners to find ways to redefine or restructure some of these financing models and also heavily base them on what is happening on the ground instead of writing them in boardrooms and then impacting them or uh, imposing them on young people. Mm -hmm. So just to give an example of what he, he mentioned, so there's always this um, condition where if you don't spend all of the money, it has to go back to, um, and sometimes the conditions, from my experience, the condition is extremely different. When I was studying Powerland, I had this vision to go to five countries. I was able to do it within a record time of two years, but by the third year, I had to scale down on two countries. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that whoever has provided me with the resources comes back and decides to take, you know, to take it back, or do they sit down with me and try and restructure how we can use those resources and learn from the lessons to create something that uh, is impactful for the, for the young people. So I think it's a question uh, that heavily also goes to the partners in this room right. to see how, what are the current models that are, uh, they're employing and are they working for the young people and for the impact we expect. Thank, Thank you. you, Mumbi. And we'll just throw that question back to the partners in the room. Mm -hmm. And on that note. Think, let, let me add something to what she's just said. Yes. And, and indeed, this is where uh, partnerships become very important. Like in our case in Rwanda, we have partners with the European Union, with the UNDP, we have with the private entities like uh, NOSCAN, and uh, internally here we have different organizations, whether it is Imbuto or uh, uh, there are many other private entities, but they all work together and uh, with young people, identify their problems, identify key areas where they can make certain uh, investments. And uh, in, like in our case, we also created a fund, a business development fund, which serves up to uh, district levels. Uh, it takes care of uh, grants if, where they are needed. It takes care of uh, the repayment of loans. It gives uh, uh, collateral guarantees, all to ease on how uh, people who need such a funds can access them easily. Uh, but also with a sense of accountability. It is not just going there and receiving funds uh, to start your business or to run your business. It's also, uh, in a way, uh, going to hold you accountable, uh, but making it easy all the way. And, and that has had uh, a great success. So, and on this note, I want to thank the partners as well that have been working together. Thank you, Excellency. And on that note, we will end our dialogue. I want to thank our wonderful panelists for sharing their thoughts. I think it's clear that the future of Africa is in good hands with leaders who are committed to empowering the next generation, young people who are stepping up, building up Africa, an Africa where young people not only have a seat at the table, but 
We're bringing our own tables, our chairs, and some Wi-Fi. So thank you, Georgie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, to everyone on the panel, please just wait one second. To everyone in the room, kindly stand. Now, it wouldn't be a youth summit if we don't take a selfie. Can you imagine? So we'll take it, we'll, we'll turn this way and we'll take it. But I'm going to ask you, who are we? And you say, Youth Connect. Youth Connect Africa. And what are we doing? Taking Africa forward. Let's just try it. Who are we? And what are we doing? Yeah. Alrighty. So when we take the video, don't let me down. Don't let me down. Can we take the selfie together? Yes. Yes, please. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll turn it. Okay, Your Excellency, Right Honorable, the young people in the audience, the young people all around the continent, who are we? And what are we doing? Thank you, uh, your, your Excellency, you didn't, you didn't say it. Oh, there was too much noise. We have to all say it together so it's believable. Intergenerational dialogue, intergenerational dialogue. Okay, who are we? And what are we doing? Thank you, a warm round of applause, a warm round of applause.